Joining me, Conservative MP Nigel Evans, the Labour MP Jess Phillips, Daily Telegraph assistant comment editor Madeline Grant and Extinction Rebellion campaigner Rupert Reid. Also joining us, the BBC's political editor Laura Kunzberg. Today... For the Brexit talks and the brings of collapse... <laughs> Well, one other person is German Chancellor Angela Merkel. According to number 10, she said a deal is overwhelmingly unlikely. Downing Street sources also say if this deal dies, it won't be revived. Not everyone likes their language. It sounds angry and desperate, and the language that is used, I do not believe should be the language of a UK government. As climate protests continue, what does going carbon neutral really mean? People will need to cut down on dairy and meat, become vegan if possible, vegetarian if possible, stopping using cars, using public transport and buses and walking instead. Busy morning for a change. Um, let's start with that early morning phone call between the Prime Minister and the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, about the government's Brexit plan. Laura, tell us what Downing Street says was said in that call. So the two spoke at 8 o'clock this morning for about half an hour. I'm told it was a challenging call, I'm told, which is political code for didn't go very well mm. at all. And the upshot really is this, is it's pretty clear on the UK side and the EU side that a deal this month is now extremely unlikely, barring some kind of miracle. The sticking point, as ever, is what to do about customs and the border in Northern Ireland. A number 10 sources have told me that essentially... Angela Merkel suggested to them, we cannot move to your position, we cannot make a deal work unless you're willing to contemplate the possibility of Northern Ireland staying in the European Customs Union. Why is that so controversial? It's because one bit of the UK would be having to follow EU rules and regulations, maybe in perpetuity. It's clear this administration is not going to accept that and therefore you've got two basically immovable blocks. Right. People may be wondering where all this information is coming from because we're going to talk about leaked briefings and also the details of texts. But focusing on this, first of all, there's been no confirmation of the content of the call from the German government yet, but an official close to the negotiations in Brussels said the Chancellor's reported comments did not reflect the EU's agreed position. This is not our language at all. Also, EU diplomats say there has been zero progress in the talk. So do we take all this at face value? I think the point is, if you forget about all the spin, and of course throughout this process, there's long process, mm. there has been oodles and oodles and oodles and spin on all sides. The point is, through the last couple of days, and I was having conversations that were basically all pointing in these directions for people who don't want to be quoted as sources or anything else over the last 48 hours, the situation is it is vanishingly unlikely to see how the two sides are going to be able to come together over this point of what to do about the Northern Irish border. The EU doesn't want to move, even though the previous deal fell in the House of Commons three times. That's partly because of the political turbulence here, but it's also because they believe that might have to be part of the solution. But number 10 doesn't want to move because politically, they don't think they could get it through or wear it either. Is the deal dead? We don't know. We'll find out uh, maybe uh, on the 17th and 18th of October when they have... But listening, but listening to all this, are you really saying that there's a chance that a deal is going to be done? I'll, I'll tell you why there is, I believe, a change in the music coming from uh, Germany and uh, Ireland. And it's because of the Ben Act. It basically gives them the opportunity to wait until October the 19th. Then they'll see what um, rabbit is going to be pulled out of the hat, if any. And then if uh, no rabbit is pulled out of the hat and somehow or other we have to seek an extension to Article 50, it plays right into their hands. They get another at least three months, another billion pound a month that we've got to spend in being in the European Union to discuss what. And Laura really has hit the head on the nail. It is literally we've got to stay in the customs union and single market for a part of the United Kingdom, maybe in perpetuity. That simply is not what we voted for. Jess? I mean, it is actually what the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted for, but um, uh, they did vote to stay in it in, in, in its entirety. Yep, and that's absolutely. because the people in Northern Ireland understand Northern Ireland and what has been throughout, whether it's Theresa May, whether it was uh, now Boris Johnson, what has been absolutely dazzling is the complete lack of understanding of the situation as it is. The, what has... Nothing has changed, in the famous words of Theresa May. Um, <laughs> nothing has changed. Men, the we? problem the day after the referendum was always going to be the Northern Ireland border and the customs union issue. 
And today it is still the problem. The trouble is, is that Boris Johnson went round the country when he was standing for leadership, being all like, oh, well, I'm better than that last one. I'll be able to sort this out and then I'll be able to get it through. And now that he's finding that it's not so easy and that he can't get it through, they have to go and say it's things like the Ben Act or the it's ben Germany. And change, I've got though. to look around for someone to blame because it couldn't possibly be me no. because I am the supreme the leader. The Ben Act is a change. Are you saying without the Ben Act, the EU would be moving towards a compromise? I do believe that that's exactly what would happen. We, what we've seen is the Speaker tearing up the rules of uh, standing orders of the House of Commons in order for Parliament to act like a government and push legislation through. So we've Someone got a Remain should. Parliament, a Remain Parliament mm. that has literally got the Ben Act, which is now really giving sucker to Brussels. Uh, Madeline, the, the thing is, it is about the Northern Ireland border and about staying in a customs yeah. union. If that phone call is completely correct, then it's over not just for this deal, but any deal from this administration. I, I think that, that's, that there's a lot to be said for that, for sure, because what this proves is the fact that uh, when you know, Brexiteers, many of whom did vote for Theresa May's deal, were essentially told that the backstop could be a time-limited thing and that both sides would work together in good faith to secure some kind of alternative arrangements. When presented with a very quite convincing, a significant step on Britain's part, uh, significant compromises on the customs point, uh, and refused to even countenance them, it does rather suggest that the backstop was a trap all along. I think what is worth saying is during the summer, Number 10 believed that they did have some very, very quiet signals behind the scenes from Dublin and other European capitals that they might be willing to contemplate or at least discuss moving towards this kind of model. Now, let's not think that somehow it was all sewn up and that it was really, as Boris Johnson used to suggest, a million to one that there would be no deal. But it yeah. is the case that the EU position has actually hardened since the Ben Act went through Parliament. That is what has happened, because now there is the possibility of a delay on the table, the very strong likelihood mm. of there will be a delay. And that has just created the sense of political turbulence here. So, of course, part of the EU's calculation is, well, look at the politics. So if they moved now, well, what might happen next? They just can't be sure, and there's a delay in there as a sort of break on all of this, that, they, that, that has changed some of their calculations. And just rather mem memorably, about a week ago, somebody um, on the EU side of the negotiations said, said to me, we do have a lipstick in our pockets, but we can only use it once mm. to translate. There is something so that they're willing to next give. Week right up they're willing the to give, but, but they'll only use it once. And now it seems there's been such a kind of breakdown that it's not going to happen in time All for right. next week's summit. Well, the lipstick is still in the pocket at the moment. Um, <laughs> Rupert, what do you think? <clears throat> so in Extinction Rebellion, we have no position on Brexit. But what I think is very clear from this whole thing, right, is that we have a crisis in our democracy. And in Extinction, in Extinction Rebellion, we believe strongly in democracy, in enriching democracy and having a better democracy. So we say, let's have a citizens' assembly to sort out the climate and ecological emergency, which politicians have failed to sort out. You could do the same for our broken constitution. Citizens' assembly? Yeah, I mean, I, I very much felt that um, at previous stages in this now endless debate um, that a Citizens' Assembly was certainly something that should uh, be used as part of the way forward. Um, a proper done Citizens' Assembly, yeah. like was done in the referendum over abortion in, in Ireland, um, it showed that a very divisive issue that, that you can find routes through with people. Um, I'm, I'm not sure... Uh, where that, that solution fits in at this crux stage now. I, but I, I'm not against it. I've got an add-on, of course, uh, which is a general election. And right. that's what we want. We want an early general election. I know. You want one too, Jess, don't you? Please say yes. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not worried about uh, having a general election in my own seat, but I, I'm, I'm not going to go through another general election that is a Rorschach test so that people can use the people where I live and say, everybody voted this one way and put their position onto people without those people having a say, I'm not going to allow it to happen so again. Not not well, we're going to come on no, to the election a little, a, a little bit later. They but tell let's me get, they don't want an election, mainly. <laughs> let's, get some, let's get some more reaction, because as you say, views are hardening are. Um, and positions yeah. are entrenched. Um, this underlines it to some extent. Donald Tusk, the outgoing president of the European Council, has tweeted, uh, Boris Johnson, what's at stake is not winning some stupid blame game. At stake is the future of Europe and the UK, as well as the security and interests of our people. Absolutely. You don't want a deal, you don't want an extension, you don't don't want to revoke Quo Vardist, a dig, obviously, at Boris Johnson's classical background. Well, I mean, I'm afraid that when you get politicians saying, I'm not playing the blame game and this is all your fault, well, what are they doing? Yeah. I mean, it's like accusing a politician of saying, you're just playing politics. Well, that's their job. <laughs> um, but I think, look, I mean, th things are hardening. It is getting, it is getting more fraught. 
less likely to have a deal. And there is, of course, a blame game going on. We've seen that in the last 10 days, you know, since the government put their proposals forward. Officials involved in the talks have said to me that what has happened is instead of a dialogue, it's been like a sort of Q&A session. So the EU said, well, can you give us a bit more detail on this? And can you give us a bit more yeah. detail on this? And can you give us a bit more detail on this? Now, on their side, well, the deal in and of itself was never going to move far enough. So, of course, they've been doing that. But on the UK side, it's like, well, they believe now, or increasingly believe, the EU wasn't interested in moving either. Right, and we're going to talk about the blame game um, yeah. and who might be prepared to move in what is a week, literally. Well, it um, doesn't that's... look like it's viable it, it, to think anybody will move enough now to make yeah. a deal next week possible. And that means we're heading either, we're, we're heading for a delay, but with an absolutely supersonic political screaming match mm. around that. All right, well, look, let's have a brief look then at this leaked um, details from the EU with a sort of point-by-point -point rejection mm. of Johnson's Brexit plan. That was in The Guardian. It's full of detail, which you can find there. But that was followed by a rather devastating response from number 10 via text message uh, to The Spectator's political editor, James Forsyth. Here are some of the key extracts. Um, it was extraordinary in its detail and its tone. The negotiations will probably end this week. Varadka, that's Leo Varadka, doesn't want to negotiate. Varadka was keen on talking before the Ben Act. Since the Ben Act passed, he has gone very cold. Um, he goes on to say later on in that text, we will make clear privately and publicly that countries which oppose delay will go to the front of the queue for future cooperation, cooperation on things both within and outside EU competences. And this is another part of the same long text. Any delay will, in effect, be negotiated between you, Parliament and the courts. We will wash our hands of it, the you being the EU. We won't engage in further talks. Everything to do with duty of sincere cooperation will be in the toilet. Now, everybody seems to agree that this is from um, the Chief of Staff, Boris Johnson's Chief of Staff, uh, Dominic Cummings. Um, Clearly but there's... from Dominic Cummings. Is it? It's clearly from You know that, do you, Well, <laughs> <laughs> as a journalist, a I'm not going to sit and speculate <laughs> about other journalists. No, but what I was going to want to say, but this is, but as they well. say, <laughs> the, <laughs> thank you, not an official <laughs> government response as such, but the language has been criticised in the tone. I, I think from day one, though, there has been absolutely no hiding and no surprising the fact that this number 10 operation is very combative, very aggressive, very take no prisoners. Their fans would say how marvellously audacious. Other people might say how terrible that they are taking this kind of tone and aggression. And that's been completely clear from, from the start of this. So that is also, they believe, collectively, number 10, I'm not talking about any text here or, or there, but the approach in there that they decided to take was that after such a long period of argument which has resulted in stasis, that actually you have to tear the plaster off to get this done. Now, that's not a justification or a defence, but that's how, they, that's how they see it. So it does rather sort of puzzle me from time to time when people are then again surprised by how they act. When we knew it's a campaign, it's not a government. I remember in this studio, the day after mm, they right. moved in and the appointments we saw Boris Johnson uh, All made, part of the strategy. We, we sat here and said, basically, it's a campaign to get this done in their view. Although, of course, Brexit will go on for years and years, even if it's just a trade talks. Um, but it's a campaign to get this yeah, over right. the it's line, whatever it takes. And it's that's what Boris government. Johnson campaigned on as well. So people, you yeah. know, he said, do or die, all that that's kind right. of stuff. Yeah. People yeah. either liked it or didn't like it at the time. But to be surprised by it now... So they can't expect the same reactions Laura, from Downing Street. Laura, I think we're going to have to let you go yeah, at this I point. Do. Thank you very much. Yes, go yeah, on. Yeah, they on. can't expect the same reactions from Downing Street because we've got a different prime minister. It is a different uh, approach, as uh, Laura said. And so when Brussels keeps saying no, no, without them actually saying what they really want, but of course the suspicion is they want us in the customs union, in the single market, paying in, just as by the European courts, no control of immigration. What did people vote for in 2016? Yeah, the European Union have never voters. once suggested that that's what <clears> they wanted. <throat> the deal that they negotiated with Theresa May was completely... None of those things were in it. So to suggest that the customs union, the, yeah, only only during the yeah, exactly. But <laughs> the, the lack of movement now does rather suggest that it was a trap all along. Right. But who is to blame? I mean, this is now the blame game. It's clear from what everybody is saying. Um, you know, Boris Johnson and Nigel are blaming the EU and, to some extent, MPs like yourself for yeah. voting in favour of the Ben Act, and and you presumably are blaming Boris Johnson for pursuing no deal. No, no, I mean, I don't blame uh, Boris Johnson. I 
think he's a terrible Prime Minister because I think that the people who are running uh, Number 10, as Laura has said, they are running a campaign. And, and, uh, and having spoken to some of them, they definitely, they would describe themselves as vote leave. I'm much more interested in the governance of the country that I live in than a campaign from 2016. Um, and I, I just... I, I don't blame Boris Johnson for doing and saying the, the things that he's done. I just wish that he would act like a statesman. And, and what does that mean? Unite... What does, and what does that mean? I think I wish that he had come in like Theresa May should have done after the 2016 referendum and then again after the 2017 general election and sought to find some consensus in Parliament, sat down and spoken about the things that people can and can't accept in the deal and tried to find something that could get through Parliament. Literally nobody has tried to do that. Everybody has behaved badly. But has we... it been a more honest approach, though, Rupert, because people were clear with what he was saying and trying to do? I think the real point that is just so evident to people watching at home from this discussion is how badly our democracy is deadlocked. So I come back to what I said before. We've got to find a better way of doing democracy. And what we think in XR is let's have citizens assembly, let's involve the ordinary people, get them sitting around a table, talking, deliberating with the best expert advice. And maybe, like they did in Ireland, they'll do a better job than the politicians. Madeline? Well, the difference between the situation that we have now and the situation that happened in Ireland was that the Irish citizens' assemblies met before, prior to a before referendum referendum. and then they gave their recommendations. Um, and then the, the, the vote that later came after that was seen to have the backing of the, of the, of the Irish public. However, the difference here is that we've already had our decision and it has yet to be implemented. And it, may well, it might well be that a citizens' assembly would, you know, say, for example, let's... let's or... Well, they might say a way backwards, which is to revoke. And actually, what really needs to happen is politicians need to get on and implement the result that people voted for. But we have this absurd situation where under normal, every normal constitutional principle, you have a general election when a government cannot function, cannot command a majority. But it's being blocked by uh, a kind of cabal of MPs, many of whom are doing so precisely because they're scared of losing their seat. They all voted so let's, them. So why don't we have them? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not exactly. scared of they losing my seat. I'm sure you're voted to I'm trigger sure you're Article to 50. Right. I voted yeah. to trigger right. Article 50. I am not scared of losing my seat. I am scared of the consequences of a no-deal Brexit on my constituents. I am scared of that. But I'm not going to lie. Already, I terrify them. Let clear. the people have a, have a go in a general election because I think, you know, Rupert is seeking a way forward which is consulting the people and I'm going one stage further and I do actually trust the, the general public. Do you trust them to vote on the deal then? No, I want the... So no, why wouldn't no, you no, let no, them no. have a say I'll about you the why, deal? Jess, because I remember the ballot paper, it said you want to leave or stay in the European Union. People voted to leave. We've not delivered on that. They didn't say leave with a deal. Well, uh, and maybe, I believe, maybe I believe that was badly if, done. I think no. we could all agree that the referendum in, in Scotland, for example, there was a deal agreed and, and Ireland, as you've said, there was a situation that was agreed on, then put to the people. So why, why are you scared because, to ask them that? Because still... David Cameron said on that pamphlet that we would deliver well, what I don't British people voted for. No, but we said that we would <laughs> deliver. It's his birthday tomorrow, And that is part then. of the Happy problem. If there's a crisis for democracy, as Rupert says, yeah. it is that we had a referendum in 2016 more people voted in that particip participatory referendum than any other referendum we've ever had in this country. And we've still failed to do it because three quarters of the MPs voted remain and they're trying their level best to keep us in the But EU. not everybody, Nigel, is completely happy with what was leaked out from a source at number 10 in terms of the language. Julian Smith, Cabinet Minister, Northern Ireland. I am clear, he's tweeted, that any threat on withdrawing security cooperation with Ireland is unacceptable. This is not in the interest of Northern Ireland or the Union. Are you uncomfortable with some of that language in that text where it says, we will make clear <coughs> privately and publicly countries which are post delay will go to the front of the queue for future cooperation. Others who act here in favour of delay they go to the back. I've got of the no queue. problem on the trade thing. On security, uh, my understanding is that we are going to carry on cooperating with the European Union at, at every level on security, as we do with countries outside, like the United States of America, Australia, Canada, and But that is New not Zealand. what that text says. The text from number 10 explicitly states that security will be under threat with those countries. The, the, the cooperation I don't see that happening whatsoever. In, well, I, I, I'm, tell I'm number 10 not to no, lie. I'm basically then. going back to what Boris Johnson has right. said and Theresa But do you want to distance that, yourself that from we, that? that oh, well, anything to do with security, we want to carry on to course, ensure that course. all our citizens are secure in of this course. country, irrespective of where we are. I think what 
ordinary people in this country would love to see is cooperation among politicians. What about this yeah. is an idea for a way forward? You have a government of national unity, mm -hmm. and they put all these issues, the climate and ecological emergency, the constitutional deadlock, maybe Brexit itself, General to, to, to citizens' assemblies, because General citizens' Rupert. assemblies will do a better job of deliberating no. on well, this. Well, well Madeline, on the election. government of uh, national unity or a caretaker government? Well, it's just... It's just I mean, perhaps the principle, if it could truly form a government of national unity, it wouldn't be so government. awful. But every time anyone is proposed to lead it, they have a habit of picking the most divisive people in British politics <laughs> to lead the government of national unity. I mean, the latest one is John Burko. Can you imagine anyone <laughs> less, know where anyone less appropriate to lead the country? I, I don't know who suggested that or where that... I think no. it was just... It's just in the newspapers but then, for the sake of Other, other right. options, you've got Margaret realistic. Beckett, the woman who said that bullying in Parliament was fine because Brexit was more important. Um, you've got But you're talking like about your Dominic preferences the leader, what about the idea in principle is not a runner? I, I think that you have, at moments of national of national crisis, people have to fully come together as they did during World War II. But I think, given the state of politics today, I think the chance of that actually happening, given the current uh, sort of awful culture war that we're living through, is just, just so unlikely. It would be a government uh, of Remain, Joe. That's the problem. Well, on, on that, and you want an election, let me welcome yep. Jane Green, who's from the University of Manchester. Hi. Um, you're one of the authors of the British election um, study. Tell us, first of all, briefly what that is. So the British election study has surveyed voters after or the population after every general election and now we also do that between general elections with 30,000 people in an online panel study so we follow people across this tumultuous period in <laughs> British politics and we try to figure out what drives people to vote, what drives people, how are these major elections, these major factors, these big shocks that are happening in British politics changing the basis of how people vote and how people, which parties people choose come election time. Well, we've been talking also uh, briefly about Brexit uh, and its role in the next general election whenever that comes. What's your take? So what we found in the British election study analysis is that major events, major shocks are changing what matters in elections and also the outcomes. So we could look at the effect of Brexit over a very short period, felt like a long period, it was a very short period before the general election, so 2016 through to 2017, what changed? What changed was the Conservative Party became a party of Brexit, much more clearly, and what also what changed is that the issues that surround this issue of Brexit, the cultural issues, the social cultural issues, immigration, became much more important. So for the very first time, we saw those kind of non-economic issues being as important as economic issues in driving how people voted. Mm. Just in the 2017 <clears throat> election. In the 2017 sorry, election. There have been so many. I don't <laughs> yes. remember which one I'm Try actually talking about. The <laughs> I, it's funny that you should say that because um, obviously uh, we do a lot of polling during an election time uh, as politicians. Uh, we knock on lots of doors and I knocked on 25,000 doors in that six week period and 12 times somebody mentioned Brexit to me. So, and then I'm told that it's all about Brexit and that it became much more about other things. And I just, I never, people were much more interested still where I live. I yeah. understand that that's not necessarily representative <coughs> of other areas um, in other things. I, I don't doubt yeah. your I data, but I, no, I, I just think, didn't I think suspect it. they want to get Brexit done, though, don't they, Jane? But I think what's, you know, what we're not saying is that Brexit is everything. Yeah, yeah, and we're yeah, not yeah. saying so that this not, is just supplanted yeah. left, right. It's not this is the dominant. Jane, but you, you're, you're from Manchester and I'm just I'm from actually, the I'm, I'm actually in the University of Oxford these days. But oh, I'm right. so, I was, yeah, I was there. Here we are. Very posh. Uh, but if you go further north than Oxford, further north than Manchester, you get the Ribble Valley in Lancashire. Every constituency in Lancashire voted to leave, some of them by almost 70%. And yet none of that resonated in, uh, in London, because I spoke to a lot of London friends and they didn't think for a single chance that the British people would vote leave. And I'm just wondering, with all the polling that's taking place at this moment, and we've seen Boris Johnson in the last 40 polls being ahead in all of them, do you think that now, with one of the polls putting uh, Boris at 38% compared to, in some polls, the Labour Party are actually in third place behind the Lib Dems, that a lot of that is down to the clarity that Boris is offering Let's get Brexit done. So, first of all, the polls are all over the place. At the yeah, moment. I was going to say. And it's not to say that they're wrong, it's just to say that there's a very fluid picture. So, what our analysis shows is the electorate is more volatile. Around half the electorate changed their vote between 2010, 2015, and 2017. So, you've got this kind of moving picture. And so, that could be moving in a very, very rapid way. Because the parties are still figuring out what their positions are, we don't know what the outcome of Brexit is going to be. We don't know if Boris is going to deliver on this kind of promise to, you know, coalesce the Leave vote and, and 
and take everybody out of the European Union. So we don't know. And so the picture is moving around and the polls are therefore, you know, trying to get snapshots of that picture. Yeah. What we can say is that, you know, within this very volatile climate, what I think is problematic is whether we kind of come to an impasse. And so it's almost like, well, let's have a general election because that's going to solve everything. But that doesn't necessarily solve everything because that creates new uncertainties and we don't know what the outcome of that general election is going to be. And anybody who says <laughs> it's definitely going to be this... <laughs> Should we'll be back Good luck. So you, Good luck. You know, Jane, what the outcome is if we do nothing, though. But what and that is carrying on with a stalemate that we are... If we have an extension for Article 50 for another three months, we're just going to be talking around in circles for another three months, more uncertainty for businesses and for well, people. Well, you've mentioned the extension and the delay. Will voters buy an electoral strategy which blames Parliament for any Brexit delay in the EU rather than the government? So, you know, fascinatingly, of course, and, you know, there is this question of this blame game. And is it possible for a politician to do something really, really important, really decisive and not get the blame for it? I mean, that would be pretty extraordinary, right? So one of the things that we chart, you know, we look at, for example, the financial crisis and show, well, you know, Labour didn't really get a lot of the blame initially. It was after the fact. It's a, it's a, it's, you know, it's not a game, but it's a strategic mm. process. And, you know, who's to say that Boris Johnson doesn't get the blame and Parliament does if lots of people are articulating the view, well, it is Boris's, Boris Johnson's fault and this was because of these actions. We just don't know where that blame's going to lie. How important will the messaging be? I mean, if the Conservatives and oh. Boris Johnson decide to go for a no-deal election strategy? Hugely, hugely important. It's one of many variables that are at play that could, you know, shift the balance considerably. Um, I think last week, the pollster and academic Matt Goodwin was talking about how uh, the Conservative strategy is essentially predicated on winning over about half of the roughly Again, polls are all over the place, but the roughly 12% who are currently supporting the Brexit Party. Mm. But so much of whether those people want to want to switch, because many of them are not are not historic Absolutely. Conservative yeah. voters. And some of them and will dislike you know, the Conservatives. Even though lots of the old tribal loyalties have broken down, there is going to be some re residual loyalty surviving. And, um, you know, much will depend, I think, on how much Boris Johnson has seemed to be uh, to blame for the delay, even if it's been, you know, essentially forced on him by Parliament. What about the effect on the Greens, for example? I mean, it's so um, erratic and unpredictable and volatile at the moment, where do you think the Greens might play a role beyond, obviously, the environment? Well, it was fascinating, obviously, to see the Greens shoot forward in the elections in May. What our concern is in Extinction Rebellion is getting the real issue that matters up the agenda. We spent most of this programme now talking about Brexit. George Monby, I think, puts it rightly. Brexit is important. And the climate and ecological emergency is about a thousand times more important. You know, if the ratio of coverage was about a, a thousand to one or even 500 to one, mm -hmm. I'd be happy. That's what I hope will be foremost in the election campaign if it comes. And that's what Extinction Rebellion, of course, is working to do right now, push that issue right back up the agenda again. All right, well, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. I'm going to say goodbye um, to Jane. Thank you very Thanks much very for much. coming Thank in. Um, and just briefly, what would be the impact of Boris Johnson having to write that letter for extension, which he has to do by law? Well, if there are no loopholes, there's nothing else, there's no white rabbit out of the hat, I think, Joe, people will appreciate that the law is the law. Uh, and uh, Boris has said that he's not going to break the law. He doesn't want to seek an extension, but my own view is that if he is instructed by the law to uh, seek this extension, then the public uh, will uh, not blame uh, Boris. But at the same time, you've got to ask what's going to happen now in that three months. And Jess, if there is an extension to Article 50, Will Jeremy Corbyn then agree to a general election? I should have thought that's what they've said. I mean, I, don't, I, I, I would never claim to speak for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, Although he that, is that, the head of your party. That, yes, but that is what they've said, isn't it? Yeah, right, that is All what right, they've said. Well, let's move on to Extinction Rebellion. We're on day two of a two-week protest, um, Rupert, in cities uh, around the world, including here in London. The Prime Minister at a book launch last night described the protesters as bivouac crusties. Is that a fair comment? Well, you know, I'm feeling kind of bad. Here I am, I, I've got a tie on. Even Nigel doesn't have a tie. <laughs> maybe, maybe I have to have a, a nose ring, according to the PM, to speak for exile. I don't think these are very seemly comments for a prime minister to be making. But, you know, I actually know Boris Johnson. I was at college with him at Oxford, and he's actually a lot smarter than he likes to let on. Uh, and so I've got a, a message for him. Uh, and the message is that this rebellion is about whether or not we have a future, whether or not our children have a future. And when I leave this studio, I will go and rejoin my fellow rebels right outside this building uh, on Millbank. Uh, and the police are arresting us right now. Uh, and if they come to take me away, I'm going to show them this, which is 
these are my nieces. These are, my, these are the people that I'm doing this for. Poppy and Rosie. Poppy and Rosie, yeah, because I love them. How old are they? They're, um, one of them is about 10 and the other is in her teens. And I'm doing this for them. And if more of us don't do this, we're not going to have a future. Can That's what it's about. And what I want to say to Boris is, I really want you to hear that. And if you let that land, I believe that you will start to change your mind and start to act accordingly. Can you do one thing for me, though, Rupert, when you do join? And, and this is really important. Um, and I crossed Westminster Bridge this morning and I saw uh, the demonstrators uh, there uh, camped out. St Thomas's Hospital is the other side. Please ensure that there is a path through for ambulances to get to uh, the hospital or fire brigade to get to burning buildings, whatever, yeah. because it is important. You know, the taxi drivers used to have a, a demonstration yeah. every Wednesday. They yeah. made sure that there were routes yeah. through. And so do we, Nigel. We make sure of that. Ambulances not with flashing the, lights. Not, not on uh, the bridge this morning. Excuse me. Ambulances with flashing lights are always let straight through. But let's remember, we are all in a Possibly. burning building now, right? That's the situation that we're in. As Greta Thunberg says, I want you to act like our house is on fire, because it is. So that's why we're back on the streets, because after our rebellion in April, Parliament declared a climate and environment emergency. But what's actually been done? Where's right. the actual well, action? Is, Where is, are the, actual the, is the disruption in that's been talked about legitimate? Well, I think that it's not so much a question of legitimacy because of course everybody has a right has a right to protest but is but that level of disruption? some of the yes i think we've re we have reached a level where uh, you know as, as as nigel mentioned you know patients are from what i could make out being denied access to hospitals there were extinction rebellion protesters on tv saying that they would be essentially making the decision as to who was let through and these people aren't medical experts this is precisely the kind of behavior and i completely fully let appreciate all ambulances with flashing lights through i can just tell I'm you that's fact all right because they're all there with their Hence, Rupert, and on yeah, Westminster Bridge. There is always and, and a channel left open for no, ambulances. Like, we're going to move on. We're go we are. Result. We're going to move on because otherwise we're not going to have enough time to talk about the other Let's issues. Talk about the bigger issues. Yeah? Rupert, it's not just about... Rupert and Nigel. Well, I'm talking about people in the back of ambulances, Rupert. That's Nigel. vitally and, important. Nigel. And now, I, I, we, I, I, are, oh, we are going to come back to it because I'm going to mention Jess's book, Truth to Power. One of the chapters is Make a Plan. Yeah. Um, do you think this lot have got a plan? It looks as if they have in terms of trying to raise yeah. national awareness yeah. and trying to I, make a point to I the politicians. I don't just think that they have a plan. I think they have a well-executed plan that has worked and that uh, for lots and lots of voters, for the first time ever, actually, the environment is top of the agenda. I mean, largely because my, our children, a lot of the time, you show your nieces, my sons go on the demos and rallies. Uh, and have really taken on board this message. What I worry about with Extinction Rebellion is how we turn that plan into practical action. And when Rupert says, what have you done since that? Well, we haven't done anything about anything in Parliament, pretty much no legislation has progressed. So I don't want you to feel too bad about uh, mm. that particular issue. But the reality is, is that where I live, most people are employed in the car industry and at the airport. And we have to we have to find a way to marry up Extinction Rebellion's hopes and dreams with the economic stability of those people so that we're on the same page. All right. And we need some proper solutions. Well, let's have a look at some... Well, about the economic immiseration going carbon... We're going to talk, we're going to talk no, no, about no. that in just a moment because Fake Ellie news. Price, our reporter, has looked at the action that would actually be needed to be zero carbon neutral. Um, there's some disagreement over when that should happen. Nigel's party says 2050. The Labour Party says 2030. You want, Rupert, 2025. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at some of the changes that would be needed to achieve those things. Our aims in a whole is to save the planet, so I feel like realistic isn't really the question because we need to just... It's either we do it or we don't. We want businesses to be affected. We want people to like be late to work so it causes disruption that the government can't really ignore. They can't really ignore kids that are blocking roads. People will need to cut down on dairy and meat, become vegan if possible, vegetarian if possible. Stopping using cars, using public transport and buses and walking instead or using a bike is a great way to get around. Making sure like your home is well insulated so you're not like burning fossil fuel on um, heating when you don't need to or heating water. Like if you can put a jumper on or a hoodie, that's a great thing to do. There'll be a lot of things that the individual will have to do, but it will become, it will come as a result of like legislation that the government makes. Are you prepared to stop eating meat? Are you prepared to stop flying? 
flying on airplanes, driving in cars? Well, I mean, I personally, I haven't cut all of those things out of my life yet because I think it's wrong to ask each individual to take total responsibility for that. But I think the change needs to come from the top down. OK, so those were the activists. But I guess the whole point is it needs to be all of us if anything's going to change. More than half the councils in the country have declared a climate emergency. They have here in Leeds. But there's a very big difference between saying... Climate emergency. Net zero. Climate emergency. Net zero target. And doing. We're using the waste heat from our uh, waste incinerator, putting super insulated pipes under the streets of Leeds at the moment, and that will bring that heat into Leeds so it provides cost-effective heat. They no longer need individual boilers, which reduces the carbon emissions. Better park and ride facilities so people don't have to drive all the way into the city centre. More cycle lanes in the city. It might be a leap in the dark for a small business to jump from a diesel van to an electric van, but we can lend them one for a couple of months. They can see whether the charging regime fits in with what they need to do. These seem like practical solutions, but are they going to be enough? They're going to make a difference, there's no doubt about that. But we know to um, reach where we want to be, there's going to have to be some fundamental changes around consumption, around the way people live their lives. We're looking at uh, ways we can finance things, but actually to get that step change, we need a lot more money. OK, we're back in London. We're at the London School of Economics and we're here to meet Lord Stern. Now, he was the economist who wrote a big review for the government assessing the economic impacts of climate change. He basically concluded that the UK, the world, needed to take action immediately to avoid devastating consequences. That was 13 years ago. When I said it was extremely worrying in 2006, I probably underestimated. Not probably, I did. Do you think we can achieve it by 2050? We have in our hands different ways of doing electricity, transport, heating. We can now organise our cities in ways that were inconceivable uh, just uh, uh, in 2006. That was one year before the iPhone. So everywhere we look, we can see how to go forward. But it'll involve investment. It'll involve innovation. I think Extinction Rebellion are absolutely right to underline the urgency of this challenge. But net zero is critical. It's not something nice to have. It is an absolute condition for stabilizing temperature. The importance of zero is this, and it's very basic physics. It's the concentrations of the greenhouse gases, CO2 and so on, in the atmosphere that traps the heat. So the higher the concentrations, the more the heat is trapped, and the more temperature rises. Um, but you think 2025 is, is, is too soon? It's not possible by then? I think to go net zero, say, in the UK by 2025 would be extremely difficult. You'd have to get all the internal combustion engine cars off the road. You'd have to get all the gas boilers uh, changed all within five years. That's a pretty hard ask. The government's target of zero, net zero by 2050 uh, makes sense. So I'm enormously optimistic about what you can do. I'm deeply worried about what we will do. Rupert, let's pick up on that. Extremely difficult to achieve what you're proposing by 2025. Yeah. Are you saying that, that people wouldn't be able to drive cars, people wouldn't be able to take flights, um, people would have to get rid of gas boilers? Extremely difficult. We need a wartime mobilisation. We need the kind of thing that we did in 1939, 1940, when everything was turned around on a sixpence, right? Uh, we need to start right now. Mm. And, we, and would, it be those thing, thing, would it be those well, things? Well, let me say this very clearly. The first thing we need to do is stop making things worse. So the question I'd like to put to, over to our Labour and Conservative MPs is, will you agree to stop making things worse? Will you agree right now to stop airport expansion, to cancel HS2, to stop building new roads, and to no. stop prospecting for new fossil fuels? Because no. The longer we keep it, we're going to fry no. ourselves with the fossil fuels we've got already. If you had an extra runway at Heathrow, it means that the taxiing of aircraft oh, as they uh, take off uh, and him is circling no. above, which is to be fair, contributing that is just trash. That is just trash. The reason they want to build another aircraft that's The reason they want to build another runway at Heathrow, as you well know, is to have more planes flying in and out. Now, if you're serious about this issue, I'm, you I will mean, agree I'm with not, us I'm to stop to making things worse. All right. Well, let Jess. You said no too to those things. I absolutely would not vote for the scrapping of HS2. It has been the single greatest economic benefit to the area that I live, where my children, for example, now say things like, oh, well, you know, when I grow up, I want to be like an architect or work in the media. Where
Whereas when I was growing up in Birmingham, you could be a public sector worker or work in uh, factories. And now those industries exist and things in the place where I live. And I have to, I have to, and, and HS2 for the environment in the long term is surely... Uh, it, no, the it evidence doesn't off. support that. What we need to be but doing about, is moving to... We need say, to have a Green Rupert, New Deal, Rupert, like Labour said. I understand that you feel very, very passionately. There are things I feel deeply passionate about that I would not give up on. But the reality is, is that how, how can you and I... Because I agree with you. How can you and I get on the same page yeah, where absolutely. my constituents can benefit and so the Green place New where Let's I live at the same time as your... We, yeah. need, we need to get on the same page. Absolutely. That's the most important totally thing. Totally agree. Will your approach bring people like Jess and Nigel on board? Look, we're here to tell the truth, right? If other people come on board with it or not, you, you can't negotiate with the atmosphere. The question is, are we going to aim for carbon net zero and stopping biodiversity loss by 2025? Or are we going to make this emergency worse for 10, 20, 30 years? That's what, as long as we haven't achieved net zero, we're making the emergency worse. Right. You're making I mean, it a bit worse by taxis having to go round the roadblocks that you're talking about. Hang on, leave the taxis. Hang on. Leave the taxis. Taxis. Hang on. Hang on. But yeah, there is an interesting issue here that you've all posed, which is about a challenge to the economy and about changing yeah. that economy very dramatically. Where do you stand on that? I, I think that achieving it within such a short time frame would be, you know, incredibly destructive to the economy. It would recall, require a kind of wholesale rethink of the way that we uh, manage wholesale our rethink. life. That sounds good. <laughs> but it's, it's, you need to bring people with you if you're going to implement this kind of stuff. We live in a democracy. And I think some of the tactics of Extinction Rebellion are really starting to annoy people, the preventing people from going about their livelihoods and so on. I think that there's, there's a danger that they go too extreme and people end up rejecting it all. Whereas mm -hmm. what we need is some compromise. We do we need to think about what we can do and also to think of ways that we can do use you know use the market for good carbon taxes carbon capture various forms of technology and extinction rebellion tend to rule out pretty much everything that isn't going back to the stone age Oh, that's such a such but a tired point, but old. Don't, but answer that point, though. Uh, such uh, a tired old line going back to Stone. I mean, really, where do you get these lines? But what, what about we're using about, the market? For example, is a green New Deal, right? And what we're about, absolutely, is bringing people with us. That's why we're talking about citizens' assemblies to go back to where we were before. Yes, but we want we want to you're, you're bypass using that the tired not, old you want to bypass systems normal democracy. that you are part of. That's the point because people are not going to vote for this in the mainstream. Therefore, you have to come up with some device that allows you to bypass normal forms. But of what democracy. happened in April was that our rebellion transformed transformed public opinion and we're going to transform it still further over the next two weeks. Two thirds of the British people now saying, yes, there is a climate emergency. It doesn't matter whether or not people like us personally. Mm -hmm. What matters is if they right start right. to hear our message and start to understand and start to feel those emotions which can move them to do the, the huge things we need to do if we're going to survive. And they this. are we huge should, things. We, Will people do, do these things? We need, to be, we need to be extremely honest about the trade-offs, not just for Britain, not just what that means for life you know, slowing down and people doing without so much that they take for granted today. And that might in itself put a lot of people off. Uh, but also what that means for the third world, because, for example, if you clamp down on economic growth in the third world, what that means is that few, more people will die from having to cook over open fires and getting particulates in their young lungs because they'll never get to use electricity. You know, we need to talk about these preventable deaths that will happen because of what is being proposed. The third world, places like Bangladesh and the, the Maldives, which are going underwater right now because of our carbon emissions. For goodness sake, what we're doing is absolutely in solidarity with the developing countries. Do we need to uh, give up? The future, but do we need to give say... up on economic growth? Is that what's needed in order to achieve what you say is absolutely vital? My own view is that it is, but. All these questions would be put to the Citizens' Assembly. That's the beauty of our proposal, right? All we're saying is, look, here's where we've got to get to. You cannot negotiate with the atmosphere. Let's have a Citizens' Assembly. Let's have the people to decide it, how we do it. It's giving up on growth. growth. Green growth is what we want. We want to do it uh, just like Jess's... Uh, uh, car manufacturers looking at ways of bringing uh, electric vehicles as But it might be too late, Nigel. Uh, well, do you know, I think 2050, and I heard what Lord Stern had to say, I got great respect for him. It may well be that a lot of these targets can be met a lot sooner than 2050 in certain areas, so. like cars, car production. I mean, when I started uh, uh, driving cars when I first became an MP, um, um, I, mean, I mean, look at, look at the huge advance, advances yeah. that have been made. On that, we'll be back tomorrow at 12.15. Bye-bye.